Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us this afternoon for this live webinar that is titled Professional Conduct in a Hybrid World. My name is Cedric Bieler. I'm the Regional Manager in Johannesburg within Retail IP Distribution, and I have the pleasure of being your host for this afternoon's webinar. Before we get started, I'd like to take you through some housekeeping rules, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with uh, after two years of these webinars. If you experience any dif difficulties uh, or technical difficulties rather during this live webinar, please use the Zoom help guides or alternatively, you can try leaving the webinar and re-entering. We are live, which means we can't rule out any possibility of any technical glitches. So please bear with us if any of these do occur during the course of the webinar. If you would like to submit any questions, please do so by clicking on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen type your question and please remember to press enter so that we get it. We'll try and cover as many of these questions as possible after the webinar. We also have some questions from the registration process and thank you for those who sent them through. We'll try and cover these as well. And we're also recording this webinar for use on our online platforms. We'll be sending an email out with a link to the recording of this presentation after the webinar in the coming weeks. And lastly, the FPI has certified this webinar for one CPD hour under ethics and practice standards. Please note that CPD hours will only be awarded for the time that you are logged in. A warm welcome to our presenter this afternoon, Delani Bezedanot, who is currently the CEO of the Financial Planning Institute of Southern Africa, or the FPI. Lelani has worked within the financial services industry in previous, uh, in various roles rather, since 1999. She started her career at a life insurer, and then she moved into the office of the Ombud for financial service providers, and then later joined the Financial Planning Institute. The following presentation was pre-recorded, and Lalani will join us after the presentation to take live questions and answers. Without any further ado, enjoy the presentation. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for joining today. Um, this is a great session that's going to talk about professional conduct in a hybrid world. So, Cedric, thank you so much for the warm welcome. Um, you know, when I listen to the welcoming, I always reflect back on my years in the industry. And I must say, I really, really love what I'm doing. But without delay, let's jump straight into the first slide for today, where we're going to focus on professional conduct in a hybrid world. So obviously, we're going to unpack a little bit about what does professional conduct mean, but then also what does it mean in a hybrid world? But let me do some justice to the Financial Planning Institute first. I, let me introduce you. Who are we? Well, the Financial Planning Institute is a not-for-profit company, and we are 40 years old. Yes, we've been setting standards for financial planning and professional advice for over four decades. We've recently updated our vision statement to read, Professional Financial Planning and Advice for All. Because we understand and take note that financial planning goes hand in hand with delivering professional financial advice ad as well. So the FBI is a SACWA recognized professional body, but we also recognize controlling body of the South African Revenue Services. That means we look after the competency requirements of tax practitioners that is registered with the Financial Planning Institute as well. We are then also the only international affiliate of the Financial Planning Standards Board in Africa. Which which means we are also the only licensing holder for the Certified Financial Planner Professional Mark in Africa. If you want to know more about the FPI and Valley proposition, please, you are welcome to click on the link that is on the slide that says FPI Valley Proposition. But let's then talk about where we are today. So this slide that I have on screen takes us right back to March 2020. Remember when we had our very, very first family meeting with the president coming on TV and said, this is where we are with COVID. We are going down into a national lockdown status because we had our very first incident at that point in time, our very first COVID um, episode in Durban, if you recall correctly. That's where the first COVID patient was. We went into lockdown thinking that lockdown was only going to last for three, four, maybe five weeks. 
whoop, here we are almost two years later. So this is where we were in lockdown, level five, where we were not allowed to leave our homes. At some point in time, I recall we were allowed to maybe take your dog for a walk, but you had to be back at nine o'clock in the morning behind locked doors. So that was lockdown level five. Um, and it's actually quite crazy to think that that is where we were two years ago. Then we started getting used to working from home. And that four or five weeks we thought we were going to um, be in lockdown then became very soon two years. So can you believe how fast time then actually flew? But then um, I believe I'm not the only one who then started working harder. You would be working during the day um, in your professional suit in front of your camera, smiling, lights, camera, action. And then it would become night and you think, but I've got so much more work to do. And in your PJs, working, obviously not in a client meeting when you're in your PJs, but you then started working around the clock. I'm sure there's still a lot of people that works like this because your excuse is, oh, I don't have to be stuck in traffic, so I can stop working an hour earlier. Remember your life um, balance. Work and life balance needs to be reinstated. Then let's look at where we are today. Today, we are in a hybrid world. So what does hybrid mean? It's something that is blended, something that's mixed. Think of a hybrid car. Um, so you have meetings with your client online. Let's call, look at the picture on the left. Let's call that person friendly Sam. And he's having a meeting with his client in a, in a hybrid situation where he's meeting with them via Zoom or via MS Teams or whichever application that the client and yourself is actually comfortable with. But we are now moving back into a place where, and a space where it's okay to have in-person meetings with your client. Again, some people are comfortable wearing masks. Some people ask you if they can take their masks off. So that is where we are at the moment. And I am of the firm view that the regulations will soon come, the disaster management regulations would soon come to an end. So this is the hybrid world that we are in at the moment, where you are working from the office, but you're also meeting clients in person. The question that we have to ask ourselves then, is there a change in your behavior from a professional point of view, whether you're meeting with your client in an in-person mode or whether you're meeting in a hybrid mode? So let's then first dive into what does professional behavior means. So as a professional, your fiduciary duty at all times must be top of mind to your client. So then you ask myself, yourself, but what is fiduciary duty? Well, the fiduciary duty for you as a professional to at all times act in the best interest of your client and to always be focused on your client's needs and be aware of that conflict of interest that may step in from time to time where you want to put your own interests first. So let's just then have a look. You have to, you've got, if we look at fiduciary duty, there's an obligation on you to always act in the best interest of the client. So that means your client's interest comes first and not the fees that you need to charge or the deadlines you need to meet or maybe the commissions that, that you need to charge and the targets that you need to chase. So your client's always comes first. But then furthermore, the duty of loyalty towards your client. That is a very important point as well. Then furthermore, if you look at the FACE General Code of Conduct, Section 2, that is the overarching um, introduction, I would say, to the General Code of Conduct that says you must always act with a duty of care, skill and diligence of a professional towards the need of your client. So that is general code of conduct section two, but also even if you look at the FBI's code of ethics that we have for our members, you have a massive duty to always act with key skill and diligence when it comes to delivering a financial service or professional delivering financial planning for your client. Then also the duty to follow your client's instructions. It is very important that you follow your client's instructions. And I have to add, legal and uh, instructions. In other words, you, you need to, if your client says to you to do something unlawful, you're obviously not going to follow that instruction. If a client says to you, I've got a suitcase full of money, let's just skip the figure requirement and I'll give you 50% of whatever is in that suitcase, the answer should be no because that's where your professional behavior comes in. So there is a duty on you to take your client's instructions and to follow the instructions, especially if it is a lawful instruction that you've received from your client. 
Then I'm not sure if some of you online may be aware of the EPSA versus DUR case or the DUR versus EPSA, depending on which court case you are reading. So D-U-R-R, the DUR case, that is where, um, you know, the financial services provider was not aware of his or her limitations and where you should hand over to somebody else. So this is about your fiduciary duty to also know and understand when there's limitations in terms of your skills, in terms of the services that you deliver. And you need to know at one at what point in time to hand whatever it is that you're doing for your client to a specialist. So understand when it comes to complex matters that you are maybe not skilled or enough experience that you have. Be, be sure to refer that to a specialist. But before you refer that person to a specialist, there is also a duty on you to make sure that you, the, the person that you're referring your client to is also actually a professional. So there's a duty on you to know your own limitations. Then the last one, when we focus on your fiduciary duty, you have to disclose and manage any conflicts of interest that you may have. So if you are still the financial advisor for the ex-wife or the ex-husband or the ex-partner, it's very important that your client is aware of that. Or if you are maybe making a recommendation into a licensed financial product where you are maybe the, the, the director in a company. So be sure that you disclose and manage your conflict of interest that you have when you deal with your clients. So this, this is overall looking at your fiduciary duty that you have towards your clients. But then we should not forget about the principles that you need to adhere to at all times. And like I've said, whether you are meeting your client in person or whether you're meeting with your client in an online environment like I'm speaking to you right now. Again, there comes that fiduciary duty in to always put the interest of your client first. That is codified not just like I've mentioned in the FPI's Code of Ethics, but also the phase, if you look at the phase Act, the General Code of Conduct. And then your competence, you need to understand that it, it's about maintaining um, and obtaining that level of confidence, the, the qualification that you need. So you need to obtain the qualification that you need in order to provide advice or deliver an intermediary service in terms of your license category, but also the professional services that you deliver. But then the competence is furthermore very much so about continuous professional development, exactly what you are doing today. There's nothing worse if a client informs you of something that's happening in the markets that you didn't know about, or something that had changed around a financial planning or professional financial um, advice component that you maybe don't know about and your client tells you about that. I think that would be very embarrassing. I'm not saying that you know, need to know everything, but at least be a specialist in the area that you deal with. So continuous professional development is extremely important and make sure that your continuous professional development actually links with your personal development plan. There may be areas where you may be not that solid or not that sure in terms of, let's say, estate planning. And it's something that you maybe want to move in. So make sure from a competence point of view that you're always up to date with what's happening in your world. And I particularly don't want to say CPD because the moment that one says CPD, everybody goes like hours, hours, points, points. It's not about that. It's about competence. Then confidentiality. There's a massive duty on you to make sure that you keep your client's information confidential. Now, you may say to me, Lilani, but these are all basic. We know that. But it also circles as far as people in your office who should have access to the information in your office. And also now the poppy that is a reality. You need to make sure if you are a key individual or a representative that has people reporting into you and has access to the information, that you comply with those eight principles of how you process the data that you have in your office. So confidentiality is understanding what poppy is all about. Some people call it poppia, poppy. Um, it's the profession, it's, it's, it's the code that deals with the protection of personal information and also the act. And I did mention a code. Yes, there's a code that you should have in terms of poppy as an FSP as well. If you're dealing with international clients, Please bear and be aware, be a, you know, top of mind GDPR and the processing of personal information maybe globally. Um, so there's different regulations that apply in different countries. Then we move from confidentiality to diligence. So what is diligence? Diligence is the consistent manner in which you adhere to your client's requests. It's about honesty. It's about integrity. 
It's about being the same person today than what you're going to be tomorrow. And then fairness is about delivering on what you promised your client to deliver on in terms of your service level agreement. If you promised that you were going to live it, deliver on something in a certain point of time, it's only fair towards your client who is perhaps paying you a fee for that service that you deliver that service on time. Then integrity, again, there the word honesty comes in again. Integrity is the quality of being honest and moral and being um, upfront with your client from the beginning. In other words, don't lie. Don't lie to your client. You know, if the markets are performing badly, you can't lie about that. I mean, globally, you can see in the news what's going on. If you look at the fun fact sheets and everything that's going on around you, don't lie to your client. I mean, the client has got access to the World Wide Web. And most of the times, you'll find that clients these days are sometimes uh, a lot more informed than you may be at any point in time. Obviously, about their own circumstances, but don't lie. So integrity is about being honest, not just towards your clients, but towards yourself. You know, have integrity to be honest towards yourself, towards your peers, people that working in the office with you maybe, and your fellow professionals. Then objectivity, that requires impartiality. And then I'm going to take you back to that fiduciary duty. Your, your fiduciary duty is to always treat the clients with, with honesty and integrity, but then objectivity comes in where there's no conflict of interest. So you're objectively focusing on the client's needs. You're objectively focusing on putting the client's needs first above everything else. In other words, above your own needs and any conflict of interest that you may or may not have. And then professionalism, if you look at professionalism, that requires behaving with dignity, dignity and professionalism at all po at any point in time. So whether you're meeting with your client in a restaurant setting or whether you are meeting with a client in the office or online, you always need to behave in a professional way. And that is uh, behaving with dignity that you need to have. So we've looked now at your fiduciary duty that you have towards the client, which is to always act in the client's best interest um, and always to make sure that there's no conflict of interest in your relationship with your client. But then also the principles that you need to adhere to at all times, whether you are dealing with your client in an in-person fashion or whether you're dealing with your client in an online environment like I'm dealing with you right at this point in time. Now, let's high level quickly run through the client interaction process. So you may have different processes. So all I've done is to just do a high level start where you start working with a client all the way to where you maybe terminate the relationship with your client because maybe the relationship between you and the client is not working. So the client interaction process does not change, whether it is in an online world or whether it is in an in-person meeting with your client. You still identify new potential clients um, via the same means that you are using. You still set up appointments with your clients, whether you meet with your client in person or whether you meet with your client via Zoom or MS Teams, whichever platform you are using. Then you are still having that very first meeting with your client. When you are meeting with your client for the very first time in person, you're not meeting with your client where he or she cannot see your face. They can see your face. You're not hiding behind a mask or something. So for your first meeting, if it's online, please make sure that your camera is on so that the person can meet you. Even if it's just for those first few moments, if you've got a bad connection, at least just make sure that the client can see you and you can see the client for the first time. Then gathering and sharing the information is very important in the first meeting. You still gather information whether you're in person or whether you meet with your client in an online fashion. I will go through the six steps of financial planning, or otherwise known as the practice then It's a little bit more detail. Then in your first meeting, you gather the information, but then you also reach an agreement to say, you want me to do that, but that's not part of my service offering. This is what I can do. And you then come to an agreement with your client in terms of what it is that you can and cannot do. And the client then also agrees with you what their needs are and what they actually want you to do for them from a professional financial advice and professional financial planning point of view. Then you are back at the office. Now, when you are in an online environment, you may be in your office, but you 
back in your office because you've ended the online meeting that you have with your client. So when you're back in the office, you then start obtaining the additional information that you need from your client. Um, and this is, remember, after you have what you call the broker note, the disclosure letter, all those um, um, compliance type of documentation that you need to have in place. Please make sure that those information is in place before you start obtaining the additional information that you need. Then you conduct an analysis where you look at this is all the information that the client has given to me. Let's analyze and see what should the client's cash flows be. If I look at the risk profile, let's have a look at where this client should be invested. If I look at the client's risk and we see that, that there's not enough cover, what can we do to make sure that the client maybe has additional disability cover? Because your analysis may point that the client does not have enough disability cover should something happen with a client, especially after you've assessed maybe the occupation that the person is in. Retirement, you may um, see that the client maybe does not have enough retirement savings. So this is where you do your, your analysis, where you look at the mortality and morbidity tables. How long is this client uh, going to live? So what does the client have versus how long this client's going to live? And at what point in time does the client retire? Through that analysis, you can then show the client that, you know what, you are very, very, I mean, there's a massive shortfall with regards to retirement planning, for instance. Um, and this is where you then also prepare that written report and proposal for the client. And make sure that you give adherence to the agreement. So if the, if the client agreed that you look at the risk cover, make sure you look at the risk cover. If that excludes, if that e agreement excludes maybe short-term, well, then obviously you're not going to look in, into the short-term insurance, but you will tell your client, remember now, as per our agreement, I'm not looking into short-term insurance because you maybe have somebody else that's looking after that for you already. So after you've obtained, and this is where the important part of the General Code of Conduct, but also the FPI's Code of Ethics comes in, and particularly Chapter 7, Section 8, um, uh, section 8 one where it talks about the qualitative and quantitative information you need to collect, the information you need to analyze, and then the recommendation that you need to make. So that refers to the written report that you need to compile. Then you're ready to set up the next meeting. So again, you can have the next meeting via an online environment, in other words, MS Teams, or you can actually arrange for the client to come to your office again, or you could meet the client. All depends on the value propositions that you have in place. So that's then your second meeting. So what do you do at the second meeting? Well, hopefully you have a nice cup of coffee, whether it's online or in person with the client. But this is where you present the analysis and your recommendation to the client. And please remember to stick to plain language. The client's not going to understand if you're going to start talking Latin to the person because maybe your background is a very strong legal one and the only thing that you know is to maybe, you know, throw these Latin terms left, right and center. Your client's not going to understand you. So make sure that you break it down into plain language. One of the principles with the regulatory framework that we are working in, and remember, we are moving from a rules-based environment to a conduct type um, of environment, is to make sure that your client is, is what? Your client is placed in a position to make an informed decision. If you're going to talk gibberish and show them how you've done your time value of money calculation, Take it from me, they're not going to know what you're talking about, but they will understand if you take the numbers and you say, and you say this is the problem, and here's the solution, how I, the professional, am going to address the problem that we have for you. Then it is also about the agreement, the service level agreement that you have to put in place. And again, if you look at some of the foundations of the FACE Act, um, it says that if an ombudsman, for instance, look into a matter, the ombudsman must give adherence to the contractual relationship between you and your client. So this is where the basic principles of uh, contract law um, it comes into play, which is based on common law. But again, this is where the law of contract comes in. There must be consensus. There must be agreement. You recall all the elements of, of a contract. And that is why your service level agreement is so, so important. Because this is where you and the client agree what services will be delivered and which ones will not be delivered and who's accountable and responsible to implement what part of the plan that you are proposing. Then the third meeting. Now, you can combine the second and the third meeting. It all depends on how you work with your client. 
the purpose of highlighting these client interactions is just high level to show to you um, the number of interactions that you should have with the client. So you can combine the first, after the second and the third meeting. Now during the third meeting, this is when you then take the instruction to implement. So sometimes the plan or the recommendation that you are proposing is not that complex and the client can actually during that second meeting say, okay, I'm happy with the plan, let's implement. Or sometimes it's highly complex, you know, where it involves family trusts, farms, um, it, it, it involves high level um, um, investments maybe that the client needs to go back and reflect a little bit. Well, always allow the client the amount of time that they need to reflect on the recommendations that you are making. So the third meeting is then where you take instruction to implement. And this is where the client may say to you, you know what, thank you so much for all the hard work, but I've decided to I, A, not implement the plan that you've given me, or B, implement part of the plan because I maybe don't have the cash flow now to take out additional life cover, whatever the case may be. Or, sure, this is such a fantastic um, plan that you're recommending. I'm actually going to implement the full plan. Now, important there, if the client decides not to implement the plan that, you have, um, that you're recommending to the client, always remember to say in the record of advice, you have chosen not to take my advice and not to implement. Because it does happen sometimes that clients would come back and say, something happened and you didn't implement my plan. You can then always fall back on the record of advice to say, but on that day, you know, the 14th of March or the 16th of March or the 17th of March, whichever date you met with a client, you decided not to take my advice. So always make sure that you record that um, because paperwork talks for you when you can't talk for yourself. Then implementation of the solution. And then after that, a very short meeting to confirm what you have implemented. And this is then again where that values comes back, uh, the principles that I spoke about and the fairness. Make sure that you implement the solution within the agreed timeframes um, with your client. Then your ongoing services is very important. We know that an annual review is required by regulation, but you can meet with your client more than once a year. Again, that depends on your value proposition that you have with your client and the agreement that you have with your client. But legislatively, you must meet with your client or review um, what you have put in place for the client at least once a year. Again, that could be in person, that could be in an online meeting, or it could be in a written format that you have with your client. Then please handle your client in inquiries or queries that they may have. Because if you don't handle the inquiries that they have in a timeliest way, in a professional way, your client may actually go to somebody else. We all know that, it, yes, it's about buying into the service. It's about agreeing to the service. But if that service is not maintained, your client will leave and they will find somebody else who will give them the time that they actually want. And then complaints. Please make sure if there's any complaint with your client that you resolve it in terms of your complaints handling process. The last thing you want is for a client to approach any ombudsman or worst case scenario, the media. These days we know because clients also, you know, they also were in lockdown level five. They very quickly learned how to use uh, complaints mechanisms that is available. So just resolve that complaint, uh, that, that complaint with your client as fast as you can because you don't want, as I said, to those cases to go to the ombudsman um, because then it becomes really difficult for yourself. Then terminating a professional relationship, can you? Of course you can. If you find that this client is not working out for you and the client is maybe working with your staff or dealing with your staff in the office in an abusive way, when we all have clients like that where they would phone the office and they would just swear left, right and center to whoever answers the phone because they're not happy with how the world markets is doing. It's not the person's fault who's answering the question, oh, the question, who's answering the telephone, that what's happening in the world at the moment, uh, it's not their fault. But you do have clients that is actually quite abusive towards yourself or towards staff in your office, whatever the case, that's just one example. You are allowed to terminate the relationship with your client, but make sure that you terminate again that relationship in terms of regulations. The client needs to understand that this is where the services stop and there's nothing worse than you terminating a relationship with a client, but then you forget to also stop the fees that you may be taking on a monthly basis. So that is just high level, the client interaction process that we have. 
So let's then dive straight into, I, I promised you that we're going to look at the six steps of financial planning. So let's just have a look at the six steps of financial planning then. I just want to make sure there's one thing that I just want to make sure that I've covered with you. Um, when you're working in a hybrid world, just remember there's a few do's and don'ts. So when you are in an online environment with your client, please make sure before you go into a Zoom or an MST meeting that you test your sound. Test your sound, make sure your camera is working. There's a little thing here that you have on your laptop that if you do that, like I've done just now, you can't see me. Remember to open up the camera, but also when last did you clean your camera? Uh, so I can see everybody now actually grabbing a piece of cloth and you're busy cleaning your camera. Yes, please uh, clean your camera because you can see when you're meeting with somebody and the camera is actually dirty. So test the equipment before you meet with a client. Um, so th those are a few do's and don'ts. Um, make sure that you are on time when you meet with your client in a hybrid environment. There's nothing more frustrating than not being on time, especially when you're working from home. When you may be rushing to meet with somebody online, yes, life happens. We know there's potholes. We know with loading, there's traffic lights that's out. So you may be late for even an online meeting. If you are late, then just make sure that you inform your client. I sincerely apologize. I'm going to be five minutes late. I'll both be. I'll be with you in the next 10 or so minutes, then please make sure that you still dress up for the meeting with your client. Uh, make sure that you are dressed neatly, um, that your hair is in a, in, a, in a nice fashion. And if you are going to get up because you maybe want to reach for the file that's behind you, please make sure that you've got clothes that actually matches um, and that you don't have a, a beautiful blouse or shirt um, or a nice tie, and when you get up, the client actually sees your boxes. Um, it may be funny for those first few seconds, but it's not funny if they see a view from you that is going to actually give them nightmares for, for months to come. So make sure you are dressed like you would have been dressed in an in-person meeting for your client. Um, then furthermore, when you're meeting with your client, make sure that all the other devices is switched off. And again, that fairness principle is stepping in. Give the client the time that they deserve, whether it's in an online fashion or whether it is in a hybrid fashion, give them the time they deserve. And if you've got one of these electronic watches that rem uh, reminds you to breathe when you're stressed, don't look at that the whole time to see if your heart is still beating, because what the client is going to see is you looking at your watch the whole time. And the client's going to see is think that you are in a hurry. Meanwhile, you're just looking, uh, making sure that your heart is still beating. The client doesn't know that. They think that you are rushed for time. And then the client may then start talking faster or just say, you know what, I can see you in a hurry. Maybe we should meet another day. Then also, please do not eat during meetings. If you are having a working lunch with the client, that's fine. Of course, the client's going to eat because you may be in a restaurant setting. But if you're in an online meeting with your client, please do not eat whilst you're in a meeting with your client. Also, do not type. If you are going to type whilst you're in a meeting with a client, because you may be taking notes, inform the client that, dear Mrs. or Mr. So-and-so, I am typing at the moment because I really want to capture what it is that you are saying. Or you could uh, record the meeting, but remember when you are recording a meeting with a client that you have to disclose to them that you are recording the meeting. Um, and then that meeting recording should be made available to the client afterwards should they actually ask for that. So I just wanted to quickly touch on a few do's and don'ts when you meet with your client online. Now, if some of these things you may be aware of already, but just, you know, when you're meeting with a client, there is really nothing frustrating when you're in an online meeting. And like with me, I'm going to do this purely for demonstration. I'm in the office today and I wave and I'm like, you know, ignore everybody in the office. You, I mean, in my office, I have a door that's closed, but there's a very big glass door where people can actually peek in and say, are oh, you busy? And they can clearly see I'm in a meeting with a client. And then at some point, you go like, give me five minutes. Um, don't do that. Ignore the people. They will eventually go away. So now we're going to dive into the very first step of the financial planning process. You would know it also as the, the, the practice standards. So this is just high level. We've went through the 15 interactions that you could have with a client. Let's look at establishing a relationship with clients online.
So this is the do's and don'ts that I spoke about. So make sure you test your system, your camera is clean, be on time, dress up, look good, mute yourself when the client speaks. And if you forget to mute yourself and you don't know where the mouse is or you can't find the, the clicker soon enough, hit the space bar. Um, a lot of times I'm in meeting with people and then they'll be talking and then the next thing you look up, you can't hear them, and that is when they by accident hit the space bar. So yes, that is a trick. You can hit the space bar to mute yourself or to unmute yourself, or you can hold the space bar in whilst you are talking. Um, and then just be on camera when needed. We spoke about it, and fix your background. I'm sure you've seen a few backgrounds that look horrific. You've got the old McDonald's behind you. You've got so many things that is behind you. Make sure that your background is, is snazzy, you can use digital online backgrounds. You're welcome to do that. But bear in mind when you talk, sometimes your head then disappears into whatever is in the digital background um, or your hand as you're talking to the client disappears. So yes, you can use a digital background, um, but it is nice when you speak to a client and it's authentic. It's you. It's the real you with your real background in your real environment. Just make sure, like I said, that your background is really neat. Then things that you shouldn't do is don't multitask, don't eat, don't interrupt the client. If the client has a story that they are telling, um, let's say they lost somebody um, during this very traumatic global pandemic that we had, they maybe lost a loved one due to COVID, don't interrupt the client and say, oh, I've lost my mother as well. It was so traumatic. She was in ICU for so many months. It's not your moment. It's your client's moment. So bear it out as, as much as you want to just interrupt your client and tell your story as well. Allow your client to tell his or her story first. And then later on, you can synthesize and say, I understand what you're going through. I went through the same. Then don't type. Um, we spoke about that. And when you're at home and you're meeting with a client, please make sure that you ask the family to please keep quiet. There's nothing more frustrating when you are speaking to your client. And we all love children. We love animals. We love cats, dogs. But they're barking in the background. Children are screaming. And sometimes you have screaming wives or husbands in the background as well or a neighbor breaking down a wall. So mute when you need to be muted. Um, at the office now and at home, I have a little sign on the door that says, please keep quiet. I have a massive sign and on my door in the office at the moment is keep quiet and please don't come in because I am in a meeting. All right, so there's a few things here that you can then reflect on in terms of your client engagement. So ask yourself, are you using that disclosure letter that you have optimally? Are you using your disclosure letter just to meet your um, regulatory requirements? Or is there more perhaps you can do with your disclosure letter? Your disclosure letter is actually a marketing tool. Yes, it's a marketing tool. That is where you tell your client more bit about yourself. I am a professional member of a professional body. I have a professional designation. These are my qualifications. These are the services that I can deliver. So make sure that, yes, it must meet regulations, but it is a marketing tool to tell the world about yourself as well. And be careful of template overuse because sometimes there's something that has changed in regulations and you still use an old template and that's very embarrassing. So make sure, you know, in your client engagement that your documentation is funky um, and that you use it as a marketing tool as well. And always ask yourself, is there something that I could have done better? Then collecting the client's information online. The question is, is there a difference in collecting your client's information online versus collecting it in, in, in an in-person meeting? In an in-person meeting, I would say it, it's a bit more dangerous because you may be in the office and then you've got real paper copies that you leave next to you and you can get it there and it can lie around. Versus with an online environment, the documentation is immediately in an online environment, perhaps the cloud, and you can immediately put it in the client's folder or if you're making use of specific financial planning technology, you can immediately save, very safely save that information in the financial technology that you are using. Just something that I maybe want to say when you're meeting with a client in an online fashion, please make sure that you're not by mistake sharing your screen 
and you are maybe on the screen of a previous client's information because that would be a breach of copy. Um, so make sure that when you are sharing the screen with your client that it is the correct client's information and that the client cannot see more than what you actually want to show. Sometimes you would by accident display your um, emails. We all have done that before. And then it would be an email from another client um, and you could clearly see the client's name and the client would say, my husband just passed away. And then you've got another client that actually sees that information and it's highly sensitive information. So be very careful in an online world what it is that you are sharing. And that's the same with an in-person. If you're meeting with a client in the office, make sure that there's no other client files lying around. So let's look at what information you need to collect from your client in step two of the practice standards. Well, as mentioned, you have to identify the client's needs, their objectives, and their priorities. If you don't know that, there's absolutely no way that you will be able to deliver professional financial advice or planning for your client. Remember to collect what you need in writing from the client, and that's your qualitative and quantitative information. So that includes information like what do you have in place for retirement savings, for education savings, risk cover, what do you have in place versus what it is that you need. Because without that information, you will not be able to do any analysis for your clients because you have to establish what cash flows does the client need from a financial management point of view. Is there maybe liquidity issues that we are dealing with? Should there be an education need, an emergency? You know, emergencies happen. Do you have enough savings for emergency? Do you have enough investments for uh, education in the future, retirement maybe? So there's a lot of information that you need. But you have to understand the client's risk profile as well. So risk profile is applicable to investments, but also to risk cover. So do you have enough? What is your risk profile when it comes to life cover? What is your risk profile if you work with short term? Because sometimes the client says, I'm happy to take a massive um, um, excess or loadings or whatever the case may be. So then you know they've got a high risk tolerance because they're willing to pay more premiums because there's maybe exclusions or, or loadings, whatever the case may be. But then also make sure that you understand whether the client has a valid will in place or not. Especially now, you know, there's a lot of things going on at the master's office and some of the stuff that you need um, from the master's office, like your letter of authority, takes quite long purely due to the vast number of people that has passed away during the global pandemic. Um, so make sure that you know whether your client is a valid will in place. If there's no valid will in place and the client should pass away, it's really quite a nightmare to deal with an estate where, where, there's inter um, you know, where there's no will in place. So make sure you gather the qualitative and quantitative information. Then again, remember to obtain the client authorization if you're going to ask for information from a third party. And then during the process of collecting information from your client, remember to tell your client that there may be a shortfall in your professional financial advice and planning if they don't provide you with all the details. So we all have those clients where they sometimes say to you, but I don't want you to see this or I don't want to give that to you. And then you have to tell your client, but there may be a limitation on the advice that I am giving to you in the end. Then just something important, whether you're meeting with your client in an online world or whether you're meeting with your client in person, the meaning of writing and written, as we see it in the General Code of Conduct, is the same. So in other words, whether you file the clients, hopefully still not in paper files and a cupboard, um, hopefully you are you know, in the space where you file your client's information on using financial planning technology or the cloud, and that it's all protected against possible cyber attacks. Um, the regulator, the FSCA, actually about a month or so ago, um, issued a conduct standard for, for public comment on cybersecurity that financial services providers, you need to make sure that you have those checks and balances in place because we know as we were in lockdown, so were the cyber attackers also in lockdown and they were a bit bored. We did see um, some of those cyber attacks that happened. And if you don't have a lot of money, um, they will actually then random where will come in. Right, so that was then collecting the client's information. Now, I need you to critically reflect on collecting the client's information. Do you see collecting the client's information from the client, again, purely as a compliance requirement, 
Or is that an opportunity for you to get to know your client better? So again, we are moving from a rules-based to a conduct-based environment. So it's about collecting the information, yes, but it's definitely more about getting to know your client. So continuously reflect on the processes that you have in place. Then analyze and assess the client's financial information. Do you, can, you can do that online and you can do that in person. So this is where you analyze the client's information. That is the meeting that I spoke about after you have your first meeting. You go home and you're in the office and you analyze all the information that the client has given you. Um, it's, it's advisable to try and not do that analysis in front of the client because it may confuse the client. Um, they're not understanding what it is that you are doing. So analyze the information and the information that you, you use, again, is the information that you've obtained. So assess and confirm the client's needs, objectives and priorities. And then once you're done with that, you have to provide your client with that written quote or cost estimation of your services. And the client has to accept that. We all know that's in the general code of conduct. And whether you again do that in person or whether you do it in a hybrid environment, the client has to agree to your fees. Um, so this is where you then analyze all the information for your client. And this is where you start preparing the recommendation that you make for the client. Then again, a few questions that I want to ask you. Reflect on your analysis phase. Is there maybe a more efficient way for you in doing financial planning or um, the financial analysis that you are doing for your client? Do you have the right financial planning technology? Are you employing the right services? Um, you know, do you have the right fintech? that you are using to, to analyze the client's information. Then also from a continuous professional development point of view, as you're analyzing the client's information, sometimes you would realize, especially when you get to that fiduciary duty of understanding your limitations, and that's why I wanted to cover the fiduciary duties and the principles first, is when you analyze the client's information, sometimes you'll realize that, oof, you know what, I'm not actually, I don't have enough experience to actually make a recommendation here. So acknowledge and accept your limitations. And then from a continuous professional development point of view, maybe it's something that you can add to your own personal development plan. Um, and maybe there's still areas that you need to master in order to assess and analyze your client circumstances. So be brave enough to understand your limitations and to make sure that you actually attend the right continuous professional development to move yourself forward from a competence point of view. Then we move into the fourth phase, which is where you develop the financial planning recommendation and the solution online. So this is where you identify and evaluate the financial plan and all the advice strategies or products and services. So yes, there is advice strategies and the advice strategy differs from client to client. You don't have one that is exactly the same. They may have similarities because you've got clients that's in different phases of their lives, but each client has got a very unique financial advice or planning strategy that you have developed for that client. Then you develop the recommendations and you recommend the solutions. And this is the third meeting where you present the recommendations and solutions to the client. Again, if the client accepts um, a, only a part, make sure that you tell the client um, what the consequences may be of not accepting the full recommendation and make sure again, and I cannot say this enough, make sure that you that you note in your record of advice um, that the client, I've made recommendations A, B, and C, the client decided to only take recommendation A and not a recommendation B or C because of the following reasons. And make sure that you put that in writing and that you give the client a copy of that record of advice as is required from section nine of the general code of conduct. And then very important, agree with the clients on the products and services to be implemented. Um, and this is where your service level agreement then also kicks in. That is that contractual relationship, but also make sure that you and the client understands who's accountable and responsible to implement what part of the financial plan. Um, so if your client is not clear on what part he or she needs to implement, in other words, sometimes it's up to the client to provide some of the underwriting requirements, you can't do that. The client needs to understand that until such time that they've provided all the underwriting uh, requirements, that the life cover will simply not kick in. So it's just an example of where you need to critically manage the client's mindset. And then be 100%, I can't say that enough, 
in terms of who is responsible to actually implement what. Make sure that it's codified, in other words, written down, and that that is in your service level agreement. Then if we move on to implementation of the recommendation, uh, you need to make sure that you agree with the client in writing on the solutions to be implemented as well as any ongoing implementation responsibilities of the respective parties to the relevant contract or transaction. So again, this is where you agree who implements what, and this is where the fairness and consistency then also comes in. Make sure that you implement the plan in terms of the given timelines. I've seen quite a few ombudsman cases where somebody um, didn't implement especially investments on time because there was maybe a lack. You were relying on your personal assistant to maybe help you to send a new business online application um, to, to a linked investment platform, for instance, and then maybe the PA was not available or she went and leave or she forgot about it. And then 10 days later, you get that dreaded phone call from the client to say, I didn't hear from you. Did you invest the, uh, the money as agreed? And then you realize that the new business application wasn't even loaded yet. And that is then where you, depending on world markets and the performance of the world markets, that is where you potentially can face a PI claim. So please make sure that when it comes to the implementation of what you've agreed upon is implemented exactly in accordance to the timelines. And if you're not able to deliver from a fairness and integrity and consistency point of view, be honest and tell your client, I will not be able to meet the timelines or what you actually expect from me due to the following reasons. Then reflecting on implemented solutions, is it possible? You always have to ask yourself, is it possible to improve on the effectiveness via the technology, again, that you're using. Uh, do you have the right type of PPS in place? Now, for me, I live for acronyms. Do you have the right people, process, and systems in place to actually deliver the service that you promise and advocate to your clients? And do you have standard operating procedures in place that is aligned with your own regulatory universe? So what is a regulatory universe? Well, part of your, regu part of your regulatory universe will be the FACE Act, the General Code of Conduct, the Income Tax Act, and any other leg legislation depending on your license categories that you have to actually comply with. So make sure that the systems and the capabilities that you have is actually aligned with what you have to deliver in a regulatory world. Then the last one is about reviewing your client's situation online or in person. So that is that review that we spoke about. Is there a difference online and in person? No, there isn't a difference. As long as you make sure that the review happens, subject to the agreed client engagement strategy or service level agreement, you and the client must agree on the terms and the responsibilities for the review and the re-evaluation of your client situation. Now, legislatively, you have to do that at least once a year, but depending on your value proposition that you have, you may have different clients that's on different levels, depending on your costing model, the fees that you charge. And that is what you, in short, call your value proposition. Um, you may deliver um, certain services to, to your type A client versus your type B client. It all depends on what services they had taken up with you. But if you do have a value proposition in place, make sure that your client understands where does he or she fit in on the value proposition? And then again, where the fairness and the consistency and the honesty come in is if your client is a type, type A client in accordance to your value proposition, please make sure that you live up to what you promise to deliver to your client. They are paying the fee. So it's only fair that you deliver on the services that you say you will deliver. Then, of course, um, on the review, um, you have to do your, your annual review, but this is also not just the reviews. If you go back to the first few slides, this is where you handle all client inquiries within a agreed time. Because remember what I said, if you don't handle your client's inquiries or give them the service that they feel they deserve, they will take their business somewhere else. This is also about handling your ongoing complaints that you may receive from your, from your client. Make sure that you handle complaints as quick and as fast and as efficient as you can because you don't want your ombud to go to the media, oh, your ombud, your client to go to the media or to the ombud. Then review and reevaluate the client situation as agreed. Then reflecting on your review process, you always have to reflect at least once a quarter, reflect on your processes. Is it possible for you to improve on your effectiveness when planning your ongoing reviews with clients? 
And I think before you ask that question is, is are you doing reviews as promised to your clients? Again, it's a, it's a regulatory requirement. Are you doing reviews? If you're not doing reviews, it could be maybe due to a lack of planning. Um, maybe you don't know which client is up for a review, when and where. And that speaks to your people, process and systems where you have to make sure that it's aligned to your own um, processes that you have to make sure you can meet your regulatory requirements. So is it possible then for you to improve your effectiveness when planning your ongoing reviews? If so, why? And then is it possible to enhance your client's trust experience when you agree with your client during the review meetings? Um, so yeah, it's always about trust. Can the client trust you? Um, because once uh, trust is gone, um, the client will take his or her business somewhere else. And trust normally um, dingles down a bit if you don't phone, you promise to phone or you promise to do a review and you didn't. And then the client automatically will start thinking, but can I trust this, this, this financial advisor with my life circumstances, yes or no? So that was on a high level, then the six steps of financial planning. Um, and in a high level professional conduct in an in-person and a hybrid world or in an online world, is there a difference in how you should behave? No, but there's definitely a difference in how you should appear because in, an, in, in a Zoom world or an MS Teams meeting, we tend to relax a little bit, um, but remember you are dealing with technology. So make sure your camera is clean. Make sure you're muted when you should be muted. Make sure your background is, is, is professional um, and that you yourself, when you work with your client in an online meeting, that there's no difference in your behavior, whether you've met with a client online or whether you would have met with a client um, actually in person. So I thank you for your time. And remember, you can claim one CPD from an, uh, one CPD point ethics um, more specifically. And thank you for your professional time. And I wish you all the best with your clients. And hopefully we'll be moving um, out of the disaster, the disaster state soon. Thank you. Back to you, Cedric. Thank you, Delani. Uh, that was a very insightful and practical presentation. I'm certain the audience can definitely relate to some of the challenges brought about by navigating professional financial advice in a hybrid world. Well, we're moving into Q&A. Uh, thank you to everyone that submitted questions during the registration, as well as during the presentation. Let's see how many of those we can get through. So, Lalani, uh, thanks for joining for the live Q&A. The first question is as follows. Uh, is it professional to ask a client for permission to record a virtual session and that keep the audio version of that as a record of advice in addition to the written record of advice? That is a fantastic question, Cedric. Thank you very much. You can, of course, ask the client if you can record the session. I mean, we are in the year 2020, uh, 2022. We know longer in the 1950s, we had to fax something or write something. Um, so, of course, you can record it, but make sure that you tell your client that you are recording it. You are allowed to store it. But remember what the General Code of Conduct says in terms of writing. It says you must be able to reduce whatever you have recorded to writing. So if you are familiar with MS Teams, familiar with Zoom, remember to activate that transcript. Um, if you do want to have a comedy hour, it is quite funny to read the transcript MS Teams, especially if you um, throw in a different language, one of our languages in South Africa. Um, it's quite funny to see how the transcript actually types that. So just make sure that the recording that you have, that at any point in time that you can reduce it to writing. I think that's the most important to remember, but yes, of course, you, you can record with permission of the client. Yeah, thank you. I think that's, uh, that's, a, that's a perfect answer. Um, another question that's come through from the audience is whether, in, in your opinion, uh, whether you know of any research that has been done on the preferences of clients with regards to virtual versus in-person meetings, especially because of the world we live in today. Yes, I, I did read some research. I can't remember whose it was, but what I can remember is the finding, and that was so interesting. Um, the finding was that individuals older than 50, and remember 50 is not old, I'm always almost 50, so we're still young. I still think I'm a millennial sometimes, um, or a Zoomer, I'm not sure. Um, but um, the interesting finding was older individuals actually prefer online meetings, and I do think it had something to do with older individuals 
models maybe be a little bit more fragile when it comes to COVID um, and not, not making assumptions here. But it was interesting that all the people we always assume they want to meet in, in, in person, they actually do want to meet online. So there is some research. If I can find it, I'll pop it over to your office and you can distribute. All right. No, thank you very much. Um, and then uh, a third question, in your opinion, what does a tire look like to a professional person? Uh, is it is it suit and tie like I am? Uh, is it much more relaxed than this? <laughs> but when you were touching on uh, professional attire and how advisors should present themselves yeah. virtually, uh, what does that actually look like? To what extent? You know, it looks different to a lot of different people. And I think we need to understand that we don't live in boxes. We all have different personalities. Um, so does your client. So professional attire is just being clean and neat. You can wear a shirt without a tie as long as it's clean and neat. There's nothing worse than somebody sitting there, maybe a, a dirty t-shirt or you can clearly see the person has just woken up. Make sure you clean. Make sure you are neat. Make sure that you are comfortable. There's nothing wrong with asking somebody at your home office, do I look okay? And our children are brutally honest. Um, so ask your children. Your children will tell you, mommy, uh -uh, that's not going to work. You know, listen to your children. They there is some wisdom in your in your kids as well. Um, and then just there was a question the other day about wearing makeup. You you can or you or you don't have to. I mean, we all have our own um, preferences. If you do wear makeup, I mean, I remember um, the news readers is more like uh, theatre makeup. If you want to wear makeup, you're welcome. But if you don't want to wear makeup, that's also okay. As long as you are clean and neat and your behaviour more than anything else is professional. Definitely. Um, another quite important question that came through from the audience uh, reads as follows, what steps should be taken in order to terminate the relationship with a client in a professional manner? I guess that's a quite important one as well. That's a very important one. There is, if you look at the general code of conduct, it does specify how you need to end the relationship with your client. But at a high level, you need to agree with your client to say, this is not working, this is why it's not working, and put it in writing where you then also agree. Because remember, if you look, I think that's why the definition of in writing is so important in the General Code of Conduct. Because in South Africa, our ombudsman schemes isn't one where you have a hearing, the paper actually talks for you. So make sure in terms, if you're going to use electronic media, make sure in terms of the Electronic and Communications Act that you deliver that email and that the client actually agree to say, you know what, I agree this is not going to work, let's end the relationship. But then again, have a look at the general code of conduct. You need to hand that client over to someone. But most importantly, there needs to be consensus that the relationship has ended. You can't just say, I'm never going to talk to you again. Goodbye. You need to do it in a proper process where, you, where there's meeting of minds and consensus that the professional relationship is actually not working. And it happens. Fantastic. Thank you for that response. Um, I think we still have question, uh, time for at least one more question. Um, this is quite an important one as well, I guess, with, uh, with the world being virtual and people being able to work in different countries. Uh, it reads as follows, are there any restrictions for financial advisors that live offshore that can provide advice to South African clients, provided that, they, that, that their advisor is qualified and remains compliant in terms of SA law, uh, especially now that people can uh, work from anywhere mm -hmm. in the world? Um, are there yeah. any restrictions um, in terms of being an advisor and living offshore? Not that I'm aware of, as long as you comply and you are licensed within the South African legislation that we have. We do, have, um, though, if you are a certified financial planner, there's various territories. So you just need to make sure that your designation is actually registered um, and complies with the correct territory. And also what is important, if you are giving advice to clients in different territories, there is a mammoth, I cannot tell you how big is the difference in the regulatory universes that we have in UK versus Australia, Australia versus South Africa. Just bear in mind for as long as you deal with a South African client, doesn't matter where you are, you could be on the moon or in that red spot on Jupiter, as long as you comply with South African regulations because you are working with who? You are working with a South African client who is based in South Africa. I think that is the, that's the test. Where is the client based? While the client's based in South Africa, then you have to comply with South African regulations. Fantastic. And maybe one more question to squeeze in before we close out, uh, which is quite a pertinent one as well. Um, someone asked, which questions are allowed or 
uh, which questions are not allowed, depending on how you look at it. When you verify a client over the phone, um, it's one thing to meet someone in person and you can verify who they are, but virtually, are there any questions that are allowed or not allowed to be asked when you're trying to verify a client virtually? There's absolutely no difference. Um, it's all about your comfort level. It's about your integrity um, and what it is that you are trying to get out of the questions that you're asking. So my, my response to that person asking the question is, what is your intention? If your intention is not kosher, um, well, then don't ask the question because then you most probably can't handle the consequences of setting your client up for failure. So whether it's telephonic, whether it is in person, but remember, again, in the general code of conduct, there is a section that talks about um, your, your call center type of environment. You have to inform the client, again, that the conversation is recorded and the recording must be made available. I think it's 15 days after the client has asked for the recording to be made available but the bottom line is about your intention make sure your intention is pure and honest thank you very much for that yeah. uh, Lilani thank you very much for the presentation and being available for the live Q&A uh, thank pleasure. you to the audience as well uh, for attending this uh, webinar uh, a survey will pop up at the end of this webinar please take a few minutes to give us your thoughts and feedback on how you found it um, but that's all from us at Alan Gray thank you very much uh, for attending enjoy the rest of your day